What's up guys, it's Dom Mutter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Netcrit video in his Riot's MMO series, I guess you could call it. He made, I think, five of these videos. Um, I was asked to react to three, I'll end up checking out the other two as well, because um, people had asked me to, after I said that there was only three people, so there's actually five, you should check them all out. So I will check out the other two as well. Um, just something on the last video, a lot of people got pissed off at me when I said that League of Legends has pay-to-win mechanics. It does. It undeniably does. And the only way you can say it doesn't is with massive amounts of mental gymnastics, right? The most common, if not actually to some degree the only uh, response that I saw, there was, there was actually two. There were, so the one was that they took it out because they don't have runes anymore. That was definitely the more egregious of them. The other one was that it doesn't count when you buy heroes because you still need skill to play them. You can apply that to literally any pay-to-win system. Right? Unless the game is a hundred percent random, you can apply that that same logic to any system. Now, is League the most egregious for pay to win? No, it, it's not in the sense that you can actually unlock this stuff. So if you're willing to put in the hours, you have just as much advantage as anyone does with money. But you still can buy stuff that normally you have to put hours in for. Right? Now, let's apply the same logic of you just have to have skill to another game. So I play a lot of World of Warcraft. Let's apply it to World of Warcraft. Right? World of Warcraft, you can buy a level boost. I don't know what they're, they are right now. I think it gets you up to, like, level 60. So you still have to grind the last 10 levels for yourself, right? So is that not pay to win because, you know, you just you still have to grind the last 10 levels? Or you still have to gear yourself? Um, you can buy WoW tokens, right? Um, so you could buy all the best gear in the game, or at least all the best uh, BOE gear in the game, right? Is that not pay to win because you still have to have skill, Right? It, th this argument can be applied to literally any game. Now, I don't think League of Legends is the most egregious pay-to-win system. I think it's actually one of the least offensive pay-to-win systems. And they have to monetize the game somehow. So, you know, not everyone's going to pay for skins. Not everyone's even going to pay for characters. A lot of them are just going to unlock them. Um, but the fact that you can pay for something that does give you an advantage does make it pay-to-win. Right? Anything else is just mental gymnastics or cope. Right. If you're trying to say it's not pay to win when it has pay to win mechanics, yeah, you're not going to be the best in the world because you bought the meta champion, right? But you again, you can apply the same logic to anything, right? Are you going to go win the next major Call of Duty tournament because you bought the newest um, map pack that happens to have the new broken gun in it? No, right? It, again, like you can apply this logic to any game, and then it makes nothing pay to win, right? And so anyway. Yes, League is pay to win. No, it is by far not the most egregious. Um, and, you know, by the standards of what people are saying in the comments, nothing is pay to win if League's not pay to win. Anyway, that aside, Races and Classes of Riot's MMO According to Lore by Necrit. Link to the original video down below, and let's check this out. Is this, this isn't muted, is it? No. Well, okay. I'm back. Last time we had a look at the World of Riot's MMO, and we talked about how the overall world design has been done for a few years now. If you have no idea what League's universe is about, I would recommend watching that one first. But now that we learned about the basics, we can dive into the other big MMO topic. The playable races and classes. When it comes to the races, just like the world, they are pretty much done. Oh yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna imagine, now I don't know too much about League lore uh i've only ever put maybe 10 or 20 hours in the league of legends total i've never been a hardcore league player um never really been a big fan of mobas i enjoy them a little bit but i've never been like hardcore into them but i'm gonna imagine they probably have like all the classics right you've got your elves your dwarves your gnomes your orcs um humans obviously um those are usually like i would say like the five basic fun goblins but those are like your five basic fundamental races um, then I imagine they're also going to have whatever the fuck Teemo is. Um, I think that's the little furry guy's name. Um, and that's about all I know, uh, for possible races. So you'll have like the five or six classic ones that you have in every game, um, I would assume. And then you'll obviously have the, uh, the different, uh, you know, League of Legends specific ones. Over the years, the lore fleshed out the races of Runeterra and now they each have their own unique story. In fact, at this point, it feels like we know Riot will not make up a brand new race. Of course, they could always theoretically do it, but I seriously doubt they would. 
because that would be like forcing a new race into the world of Lord of the Rings. It would feel off among all the already established rules. I strongly doubt you- I, I think the difference there is Lord of the Rings was written by one guy almost a hundred years ago. And is then Lord of the Rings is like very like Lord of the Rings is supposed to be like a new mythology for Britain. It takes a lot of aspects from um, you know the mythological age of the Germanic peoples, of the Celtic peoples, of uh, the Romantic, uh, the Latin peoples. Right? It's very much influenced by like the three major players when it comes to you know British history. Right? You've obviously got the Celts. Um, and even some aspects from pre-Indo-European history, but, you know, the, you've got the Celts, then you've got the Romans who conquered it for a short period of time, um, then you've got the Germanic invaders, and then obviously the Norse who conquered it for a little bit who were also Germanic, and then, so, it, it's very much like a mix of, like, different branches of Indo-European mythology with some pre-Indo-European aspects into it, and then also some aspects of Christianity because, uh, he was, like, a really, really devout Catholic, um, that being said, though, it was written by one guy almost 100 years ago. That's why it's not going to change. I, I think, you know, if you look at something like World of Warcraft, um, you know, World of Warcraft is a, a series that's been out. I, I can't remember when the first one came out. I think it was 94, 95 was Warcraft 1. I might be wrong there. Um, so you're talking about a series that has been out for almost 30 years at this point. Um, and they, you know, they just added the Drakthir. Uh, in their latest expansion, which came out like two, three months ago. Um, so I could see League doing that, especially because it's, it's like a, a corporation that's running it and not a not an individual who's been dead for half a century. You want to put a bunny person next to Aragorn. With that said, don't worry, because the lore will allow Riot to make up new races and make them feel natural. I'll show you their clever system in just a moment. But for now, just know that, yes, we already know the races of this world. So the question is not going to be what races Riot is going to make up. The question is going to be, from the races that already exist, which ones will be playable? Yeah. And perhaps more importantly, how will they be playable? You see, a few years back, I released a similar video where we talked about the classes and the races together with TB Skyen. And today, I would not recommend you watch that video. Back then, I was still clinging onto the idea that faction-based MMOs were a good idea. It worked for WoW and it worked for my guilty pleasure, Wildstar. Unfortunately, what I didn't... I think they, they are, but they don't need to be. Um, and I think that's a big problem you have with a lot of games is... And, and is that like they try... Like a lot of MMOs nowadays just try to be WoW clones and you don't have to be. Now, in certain mediums it makes sense right so star wars you're obviously gonna have like the the jedi and the sith right and then you're gonna have factions aligned with them in lord of the rings you're gonna have um you know the forces of good and the forces of evil and and so this makes sense in like those games and those worlds um and in it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that like uh, destiny is an mmo right a the, there's no factions in Destiny, right? At least not, like, factions that, like, players can't associate with each other if they're in one or the other faction. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. And one thing that I... Maybe there's been an MMO that's done this, but I can't think of one. If there is one, just comment down below. But why is there... You know, everyone seems to think it's either no factions or two factions. Why can't there be multiple competing factions with, like, varying alliances? So, like, if you have... You know, maybe let, let's. I'll just say races for an example, but say like the troll. Say let's use World of Warcraft races for example. You've got the trolls, the orcs, and the tauren. Um, well, maybe the trolls and the orcs get along, and the trolls and the tauren get along, but the tauren and the orcs don't get along. Um, and you can have like weird mixes and matches like that. Now, obviously, that makes the game more complicated, and you're gonna have to have a large enough player base that that's actually viable. But that's not something I think League or uh, Riot is going to have a problem with. I think they're definitely going to have a massive player base. Look at how popular um, League of Legends is. Uh, you know, Valorant is huge. Um, trying to think what other games they make. But I mean, those two alone are fucking massive, right? League is consistently one of, if not the most popular games on Twitch. 
Um, and again, Twitch isn't a perfect metric because there's a lot of games that are popular that don't get much viewership on Twitch, like Civilization VI, consistently one of the top 10 most played games on Steam, and it averages like maybe 500 viewers on Twitch. Um, but League is like crazy popular, and Riot's world, universe, whatever the fuck you want to call it, is crazy popular. So I don't think, as long as the MMO is half decent, I don't think they're going to have an issue with player numbers. Um, so they could have multiple factions. They don't necessarily need to have one. They don't necessarily need to have two. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot of games make the mistake nowadays of copying World of Warcraft where you need two competing factions. And it makes sense in WoW's lore, uh, especially the more recent lore. Like, obviously, it didn't really make sense. It, you know, ironically, originally, it didn't make sense in WoW, right? If you play Warcraft 3, you've got the Night Elves and the Humans and the Undead and... Uh, the orcs, right? The orcs, Torin, and trolls working together makes a lot of sense, right? That's what happened in Warcraft 3. You just continue the story. Um, but the Night Elves were kind of their own thing. They did work with the humans sometimes. And in fact, they did work with the orcs and the trolls and the, um, you know, the undead didn't break off until the time period between Warcraft 3 and uh, uh, World of Warcraft. Right, so like a lot of the, you know, even in some regards, the the World of Warcraft thing didn't originally necessarily have to happen. No, is that merely a year later, the idea of faction-based MMOs would crumble to dust. That's because factions have a massive flaw. Besides the fact that PvP is almost guaranteed to be one-sided. I mean, who would want to play for the losing side? Especially if there is no compensation. Classic WoW is a perfect proof of that, yep. not to mention New World. But also, if you split everyone into two sides, you are splitting up your player base. And that is almost never a good idea. You see so WoW's actually kind of gotten ar around this recently with, um, so I, I think it's called Mercenaries, was the way you could do it in PvP. So basically, if you play horde or alliance on a server that's overwhelmingly the other faction you can actually queue you can go to a certain person in i think it's dalaran um and you can queue for the other faction um and then just in the newest expansion they actually added that you for mythic plus dungeons and i think also for raiding you can do cross faction teams so like if you're horde and you know you can invite a night elf you can invite whatever to your team um so yeah it's they've they've kind of in some ways they've been moving away from this in wow even though they still have obviously you know the whole pvp system is built around it to some degree simply don't want to prevent people from playing together the reason why in the past it worked for wow is because blizzard heavily played into the faction pride people were proud to fight for the horde or the alliance but even back then it really wasn't perfect and then people started min maxing the game and they realized that factions didn't matter and that's where Riot has the edge. You may know that League of Legends has a lot of different regions, where they all act independently and they all have unique relationships with their neighbors. Because of this, forcing faction alliances into this world would ruin the already established lore. So PvP factions are most likely not going to be a thing. However, despite that, League absolutely has faction pride. People love it when a new Shuriman champion is announced, because people love that place. And people love it when the new champion is not Ionian, because goddamn we have too many Ionians. Nearly every League of Legends player has a favorite region. And you bet when the MMO comes out, people will want to play for that region. And this is where the brilliance of Riot's world kicks in. You see, the fundamental lore of League of Legends is based around the idea that anyone can be from any region. After an event the story refers to as the Westward Migration, races mixed up all around the world. So it's not like there is a furry region where you can only see furries. There are definitely regions where- That's unfortunate. We need to quarantine them. Just keep them in one little region and they're not allowed to leave. Or you can see more furries. But this world doesn't have exclusives. This means that when you're picking up what you want to play, besides just picking a race and a class combination, I strongly suggest Riot also allows people to pick their origin, with the origin being the starting region. Without a system like this, you would force all human champions to be, for example, Noxian. And that is simply not how this world works. 
So, I've been mambling about how this world works for quite a while. So now, let's actually dive into all the races that exist in this universe. Spoiler alert, League doesn't have too many different races, because it's focusing on depth over variety. Of course, as it is with any RPG, there is the human race. But it would be cool if the humans varied depending on their origins. For example, if you pick a human from the Freljord, they would be an Iceborne and they would have extra frost resistance. A Demacian could have a bit more magic resistance, Ionians could have a bit more nature resistance, Shuriman's heat resistance and so on. I think it's going to be crucial for Riot to preserve the feeling of every origin feeling at least slightly different. This is an RPG after all and despite the fact that balancing is usually a big issue, I strongly believe these RPG elements have to be preserved. But if Riot is afraid of people min-maxing the game from the very beginning, focusing on the origin stat with the most value, Riot can always do the safe thing and only give each origin different customization. In the Freljord people tend to be more pale with lush beards and Nordic tattoos all over their bodies. Shuriman's have the classic dreadlock style. People from Bilgewater have the pirate crew tattoos. Piltovens are your fancy mustache people. And Ionians have the wild untamed hair and beards. So even without special origin stats, I do believe these unique character customizations would enhance the region pride too. So that's what humans would be about. Pretty versatile and nothing too special in an RPG world. So now let's have a look at the more unique races. After humans, the second most spread out race are the Vastaya. As we mentioned in the last video, Basically the satyrs or satire or whatever the fuck they're called. Satyrs? Is it satyrs? I've never been sure how to pronounce that word. I'm pretty sure it's satyrs. Um, but yeah, like goat people. I can imagine the amount of Rule 34 about this. Fucking degenerates. <laughs> the Vastaya are a race that came to be after humans started mating with magical animals. But the thing is, depending on where they are from, there are loads of different kinds of Vastaya. From cat boys to fox girls to lizard girls. In fact, here's a family tree of. Okay, who fucked a lizard? How do you even fuck a lizard? Do you like jerk off on its eggs? It's like, what the fuck is going on here? Because. <laughs> oh my god. All the Bastian tribes and even. Alright, so what do we got here? Um. So humans and then Vastai Shirai. And then, okay, they've made Visaya and they just split into like all of these. So you got the Landwalker tribes, tribes of the sea, and then tribes of the sky. Even this doesn't cover all of them. And this is where Riot can pull off something genius. As I said, this world already has set rules. So it would be very difficult to introduce a brand new race into this universe. However, it is going to be very easy to just make up a new Vastayan tribe. So I propose that Riot doesn't make the Vastaya as a playable race overall, but instead it would be cool if Riot let the specific tribes to be playable races. This would leave the door open for them to introduce new playable races later down the line. If they cross off all the Vastaya at once, they kinda shoot themselves in the foot. But I know, I know, here I go mumbling about how the world works again. So let's have... Yeah, so you, you kind of saw this with, um, you know, World of Warcraft kind of did something similar with this when it comes to, uh, you know, the trolls, right? You've got both the Zandalari and just the, the Dark Spear trolls. Um, you've got humans with uh, your standard humans and your Kaltirans. You've got uh, the elves now have the Night Fallen, the Void Elves, the Blood Elves, and the Night Elves. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of this in World of Warcraft, too. Uh, which is pretty smart that, you know, having each tribe or each subsection, whatever you want to call them, as their, you know, own race with their own racial abilities and all of that stuff. Um, definitely a, a good idea. Have a look at some of the specific tribes. When I say Vastaya, most people think of Ari. She comes from the Vasani that look like foxes. Although her tribe is mostly gone, the lore can justify new members to be found. So they can be playable. The Kilash tribe comes from the jungles between Shurima and Ishtal. These lion-like people are known for hunting dangerous beasts. 
and they take great pride in trophy collecting. It's the average mount collector. The Shimon tribe are monkey-like people from Ionia. While their older members are very wise, their younger members can be very goofy. The Otrani come from Mount Targon, resembling the classic goat people. Their hobbies are taking care of the stellar corns. The Lothland tribe. So those are people are well who ever fuck the goat. Bird people. This tribe likes to combine the art of dancing with lethal assassinations. The Ubi cut. Okay, again, who fucked a bird? Who who like jizzed on a bird egg? We're going to talk about how lizard and bird eggs get fertilized here. Who? Which degenerate in this fucking world? <laughs> you know, it's cool lore until you think about how this happens. You know, lizards and birds lay eggs. What are you doing here, bro? Are something close to lizards. Though they do have the ability to shapeshift. Zuckerberg. Out of all of the other tribes, these are the closest to their pure blood ancestors. And we also technically have the Marai. The Naga. The fish people, whom I doubt are going to be playable. Imagine modeling boots for them. Now, these were the Just more pure blood tribes. But there are many, many more Vastaya who don't fit any of these. For example, Set has an Ionian Vastayan mother and a Noxian human father. So he doesn't really have a tribe. Long story short, the Vastaya are an incredibly versatile race and Riot can use them in a million different ways. This is where they can really go wild. But that's it for the Vastaya. So now, let's have a look at the third most popular... Yeah, so I think, I think the big thing with it when it comes to the Vastaya, for, and this is, you know, obviously I, I'm not a huge League of Legends lore nerd, so I don't know too much about them, but... Um, you're you're gonna have to choose certain ones that are like <clears throat> common within the universe and make those the playable races or play, uh, sub race whatever you want to call them because you obviously you can't have 50 million different variations um, in terms of like what kind of animals they can be how human are they how animal are they um, you know you'll have certain things when it comes to like customization obviously for like you know cosmetic customization. Um, but when it comes to like actual functionality, you're gonna have to pick a handful of these and like focus the racial abilities and racial benefits on them because you're not gonna be able to have a bajillion different racial benefits unless somehow you have the racial benefits tied to how the customization looks. But then you would have everyone look the exact same once they find out what the best way to min max your character is. The race. The Yordles. These are the classic RPG tiny people. In League of Legends, people either adore them or hate them. Oh, yes, no yes. In that's Teemo, right? Kinda like those guys. But not those guys, everyone hates them. The gnomes. There is no doubt in my mind that Yordles will be playable. Even though they have an interesting catch. You see, unlike all the other races on Runeterra, Yordles are immortal. They are essentially modes of magic that come from a hidden magical realm known as Vandal City. And because they are made of magical essence, when they die, we don't really know what happens. But we assume they return to the Vandal City and there they respawn. With that said, the lore suggests that maybe- So basically night elves before their tree got burnt down. Maybe Yordles can die, but they just can't die of old age. But let's ignore that, that's a massive rabbit hole. So, you know, when it comes to gameplay, at least corpse running is going to make sense for them. <laughs> now, because Yordles are immortal, in most cases they are always happy and cheerful. Even their home realm is very colorful because of that. But then there is also Vex, a Yordle champion who has recently been added into League of Legends, who gives Yordles an interesting perspective. You see, unlike all the other Yordles, Vex hates living. She hates the bright colors and the cheerfulness. You know, it's the average league player. So <laughs> Vex is constantly. In she's your I am fourteen. She's basically like the, uh, the the manic pixie dream girl. I am fourteen, and this is deep. Fucking wanna be edge lord emo chick. In deep depression and agony. All she wishes for is to leave this world, but she can't because Yordles can't die. Anyway, just like all the other races, Yordles can be found all around Runeterra. 
There is Poppy in Demacia, Colette in Noxus, Ganon in Ionia, Rumble in Shurima and so on. But now, so far we have only covered the races which I'm pretty sure will launch with the MMO. The humans, the Vastaya and the Yordles are the core of this world. So now we are diving into the races that still exist in this universe. But it's going to be up to Riot if they make them playable. First of all there are the Minotaurs. The Minotaurs are different from the Vastaya because they don't have magical ancestors. They are just a standalone race. Originally the Minotaurs controlled the mountains south of Noxus. But because Noxus is Noxus, soon they absorb the Minotaurs into their empire. With that said, some Minotaurs fled the tyranny of Noxus and they joined the other regions. A great example is Kryl, the Minotaur fighting in the elite armies of Demacia. And yes, the Minotaurs also have the stereotypical sexy female version in this universe, <laughs> that can easily be turned into a playable race. Next in build <laughs> Man, every game does that. It's so funny. The males are like these massive hulking brutes, and then the females are like a sexy version of that. The only thing I can think of that's not like that is like female trolls and female orcs in World of Warcraft. Everything else is like even like I guess Torin too. Um but like most of the races, like even if the male is like grotesque looking, the female still looks good. It's a classic fucking, you know, tropes. Just massive sexual dimorphism. Which I guess, you know, it, it does happen a lot within a lot of species, but it's so funny that, like, they're always, you know, sexually dimorphic in a way that's appealing to human eyes. Ilgewater, there is an incredible amount of weird... And maybe that's why all these dudes are out here fucking jizzing on these eggs. Which is, again, just so... Yeah, whoever, whoever either, whoever thought of that either didn't think through how that would have to work or they did and they have a fetish fishy people a lot of these could be really cool playable races when bilgewater gets its expansion although modeling helmets for a hammerhead shark is going to be interesting we also can't Just do it wow doesn't don't <laughs> previously i showed you the ice trolls but there are also the sand trolls and here's an interesting fact for league veterans we have never seen a sand troll, but because of Ezreal's adventures, we know they exist. They should be around Ikathia, which is where Jax is from, who also has three fingers, by the way. So it is extremely likely that the mysterious Jax is a sand troll. Regardless, the majority of trolls are united under Trundle, the self-proclaimed troll king, who is fighting in the service of Lysandra who is a baddie even though she is morally right. So since the majority of the trolls are our enemies, I doubt they will be a playable race. Lastly, let's not forget that this universe also has yetis. Fun fact, before everything got frozen, the yeti civilization was very advanced. They even had their own technology based around magic. In fact, Willem, the yeti Nunu is riding on, is a hologram from the yeti technology. But then, as the civilization disappeared, the yetis went a bit more ferocious. So no, they won't be playable either. But that's pretty much it for the races. As I mentioned, there aren't too many different kinds. But that's because Riot is avoiding mimicking other RPGs. That's why there are no dwarves or elves here. Runeterra is simply trying to be unique in every way, and so far, it is working. Now, I also have seen some people asking if Darkin will be playable. To which I have to say, that's like asking if you can play as a god. The Darkin are a corrupted version of the Ascended God Warriors. A single Darkin can annihilate an army of a thousand. In fact, the Darkin known as Aatrox is the only being in existence that managed to kill a celestial god. He stabbed someone wielding the power of the aspect of war so hard, the aspect of war died. So no, I don't think Darkin will be playable. Anyway, with <laughs> all the races covered, assume... I mean, I guess it depends on how they do power scaling in this game. But you could make them playable. It would just, again, it would really depend on how they do power scaling. Because you see this, again, you know, use World of Warcraft as an example, because it's one most people will be familiar with. Uh, and it's the one I'm most well-versed in, but... You know, obviously, like, uh, vanilla World of Warcraft, 
you start off, you're just some random adventurer. By the time you get to the end of Vanilla, you're, you know, you're like a noted hero, right? Like you're kind of, not really like special special, but kind of special. Um, end of Burning Crusades, you know, by the end of Burning Crusades, you're a little bit more well-known. End of Wrath of the Lich King, you're a little bit more well-known. Um, you, you defeated the Lich King, which is crazy impressive. Then you get to Dragonflight, and you're defeating, or not Dragonflight, sorry, uh, Cataclysm, and you're beating, you know, this aspect who is, like, basically, like, I guess, like, the best thing to compare to is, like, a demigod. Um, and then in Panda, you're killing, like, you know, gods, and it, it's just, like, it scales and scales and scales to the point where, like, you're the chosen one, this, like, you know, destroyer of worlds type fucking character by the time you get to Dragonflight. Um... I feel like depending on how they do power scaling and how fast the power creep happens, it feels like it'll be inevitable that at some point the Darken would make sense to be playable. But I don't know. I don't know enough about the lore to know if that makes sense, but I assume it would. Assuming Wright is going to use the origin system, this is what the playable races could look like. Alright, so... Um, humans, okay... So, what's is he saying? These are just different starting zones, or this is just different uh, factions. So humans would be all of them. Vestaya, not in Demacia, not in Freyhold. Uh, only these specific ones, I'm guessing. In okay, Yordles, not Freyhold. Uh, Minotaur, okay. Humans are versatile, they are everywhere, there is not much to mention there. When it comes to the Vastaya, the common tribes can easily appear in Noxus, Piltover and Bilgewater. These are the regions open to everyone. On the other side, the Vastaya are closely linked to spiritual magic. So you will hardly find one in Demacia, since it is a firmly anti-magic region. And somehow, not many Vastaya were ever mentioned in the Freljord, so Riot doesn't have to force them there. But then we have Shurima, Ionia and Targon. Assuming these would be saved for expansions, they could be used to introduce new playable races. Since I doubt all the newcomers remember the names, the Kilash, Lothlan and Otrani are the lion people, bird people and goat people. When it comes to the Yordles, as I mentioned, they can originate from anywhere, but they do avoid the Freljord and Targon because of the harsh climates. And yes, I know, there were some prehistoric Yordles in the Freljord, but after it got covered in ice, they disappeared. And lastly, the Minotaurs can be found in Demacia and Noxus. But it does make sense for some of them to flee to the Freljord, and others to travel to Ionia during the invasion. With all of this said, remember, this is just my decently educated opinion. Since the races are pretty much mixed up all over Runeterra. Riot could also lift the limitations and let every race start in every region. And I would be fine with that. Some story would be wonky, but it wouldn't be anything horrible. Although, I still believe some racial exclusivity helps the feeling of RPGs. So, all of this is still only the first half of the video. If you wanna take a break and do your business without washing your hands, now's your chance. If you can catch it, you can kick. <laughs> I'm guessing that's got to be an Asmund Gold reference, eh? I'm guessing was Asmund watching these live on his stream or something because that's got to be an Asmund reference. Um, I know that's like a meme within his community and stuff. But yeah, so far I'm liking a lot of what he's saying. Um, I, the thing I just wonder is, you know, are are they gonna do, you know, one faction? Or sorry, no factions, two factions, multiple factions. Um, so I think that that changes how the game plays quite a bit. This program will continue in five seconds. A cat on a book. Did you wash your hands? Okay, so far we only covered the races, which was definitely still the easy part. The much, much, much more difficult part are going to be the classes. This is where Riot is facing a great challenge. Partially, it's because there are inherently <clears throat> no wrong answers when it comes to designing a class system. So yeah, uh, classes. Let's see. You've got your, you've got your warrior. Obviously, every game needs a warrior, right? Um, you've probably got your paladin, right? Every game has a paladin. Um, you'll maybe have a monk. Most games have monks. Um, 
maybe warlocks, mages. I don't know what kind of magic they have in this to know like what kind of mages specifically they would have. Um, maybe necromancers. Um, I honestly don't know enough about the lore to know what kind of magics there are and stuff because what kind of magic you have is like very instrumental in how and what kind of classes you have and how they play and stuff like that. Um, but I would imagine you'd have obviously like your warrior, some kind of mage, some kind of, you know, a paladin, probably some kind of druid of some sort because I know they have nature magic. Um, you know, a lot of just your run-of-the-mill stereotypical like you know dungeons and dragons world of warcraft you know your basic rpg stuff uh, obviously some kind of like ranger or hunter or something like that right a range bow wielder you can really make anything work if you put some thought into it but more than that riot Ninja. is challenged by the setting itself league of legends currently has over 160 different champions they each have unique abilities and together they can define about 40 different classes. I counted them myself. From these, Riot has to pick only a handful to be playable, which means the majority of the classes won't make it in, and people who love those classes will be disappointed. Thankfully, I'm not a designer, so instead of trying to figure out how to make this work, I'm going to show you all the cool unique classes this universe has. One thing they could do, and I wish more MMOs would do this, I th RuneScape is the only one that I can think of that does this, is just not have them. You have skills, you level those skills, and as you level those skills, you get better. You get better in magic, you get better in melee, you get better in range. Uh, I would love to see a game. I, there's a lot of RPGs that do this, but there's I can't think of a single MMO that does this other than RuneScape. You make a character, and you have... You know, whatever the classes they decide are in the game. So say they have, like, there's a warrior class, there's a mage class, there's a priest class, there's a druid class, there's a necromancer. You know, all these different classes. You can, like, start leveling up your warrior class. Then you decide, yeah, I don't want to do warrior anymore. And then you start leveling up your fucking necromancer. Like, I don't want to do this. Then you're going to go priest for a bit. Then you're like, I don't want to do this. I go back to that. Right? And then, like, you can, like, <clears throat> as you get higher and higher and higher, you can mix and match the spells and stuff. And have certain gear sets that are good for certain, uh, cl you know, classes or jobs or whatever you want to call it. It's different in different RPGs. But, um, honestly, I would love for a really good MMO to just not have classes. And just have, like, everything available to everyone if you're actually willing to put in the time and grind for it. And again, because region pride is a big part of this universe you'll see that some of these are tied to specific regions. But not the warrior. That one is different in every single region. So let's start with <clears> that. <throat> the warriors in this universe provide a unique challenge on top of the already difficult decisions. It's because in every region the fantasy of a warrior is represented by something else. In Demacia it is the Dauntless Vanguard. These are the classic knights in shiny armor pursuing justice. In Noxus, the traditional warrior would be part of the Trifarian Legion, which is a rank you can achieve after killing your best sparring friend in combat. These guys rarely use shields. In Shurima, the classic warrior is the warrior of the Golden Army. These are fighting for the glory of the Shuriman Emperor. In Piltover, you would have the Enforcers. Simply said, it's the cops. People mm -hmm. will know these from Arcane. It's the Popo. But in a way, the Wardens are the melee warriors of Piltover. But then, in the Freljord, warriors are represented by the Berserks, either wielding axes or giant blades as they worship the primal god known as the Iron Boar. On Targon, we have the Warriors of Rakor, which are somewhat themed after the classic Spartan armies. Then, in Ionia, the classic warrior is known as a blade master, a samurai. with samurai-styled swords that have a rich history in this region. Also, there are the Vuju blade masters, which are on a totally different level. The Vuju technique is so powerful it was forbidden from using it in combat. The TLDR version of the story is that when Noxus invaded Ionia, Master Yi obliterated entire Noxian legions on his own before Noxians realized how overpowered he was and they nuked the town where the Vuju Blade Masters were trained. So now there is no more Vuju Blade Masters, just normal Blade Masters. And lastly, the common warrior in Bilgewater would be a brawler. 
You see, I just named eight different kinds of warriors. How is Riot going to handle this? I don't know. They could just make one warrior class and then just have the players play out the fantasy while wearing cool armor sets. Or they could make... Yeah, so there's a couple different ways I could see them doing this. One, um, so like WoW has the subclass system, right? So you could do subclasses, but obviously eight is quite a bit. Um... So that could be a bit, you know, that could be a way to get at least like three or four of them out of it. Um, another way would be, you know, even within the class, you know, if you have like say a talent tree similar to World of Warcraft, uh, depending on how you spec your guy, you, you'd play more like one of these subclasses than another. Um, you could, you know, maybe divide them into multiple classes, maybe have the brawler be a different class, you know, like kind of the way you're describing them, you could probably divide those into like one being like a paladin, one being a warrior, one being a brawler um so th there's multiple ways to get around that um but yeah a, lo a lot of it would just depend on remaining consistent to the lore and then also how exactly they design the game engine itself and by that uh, not, not necessarily the game engine i shouldn't say but like the the how they design the mechanics of the game i guess is the best way to put it Make it so that every origin has a different skin of the class. You know, all the abilities would be the same, they would be doing the same numbers, but when a Noxian swings a weapon, there is a bloody trail, and when an Iceborne Berserk swings a weapon, there is a frosty effect. But again, this is for Riot to figure out. Now I'm just going to show you all the unique and interesting classes from this universe. In Demacia, we have the Mage Seekers. These are the people who hunt down mages. They carry with them a stone disc called the Grey Mark. This is the tool that allows them to absorb magic. So, so it, this would be sort of an anti-magic class. So like a tank. There are also a lot of iconic Demacian scouts. Also, Demacia has a lot of stories about theaters and bards. But Demacia also brought spotlight onto the Sentinels. The Sentinels of Light are people dedicated to fighting the undead. Because the undead can't really be killed with normal weapons they use the relic stones that can be forged into any weapon, be it a crossbow, a gun, a really big gun, or even a sword. Fun fact, in the lore, the sentinel guns don't have triggers. You have to will it to fire with every fiber of your body. So of course, Lucian canonically fired it with his PP. Pee -pee. Lastly, this <laughs> would be unknown to e What did that say? every fiber of your body. So of course, Lucian canonically fired it with his feet. Uh, it requires control, said uh, Cena. It requires focus. You need to fire with every fiber of your being. Lucian laughed and turned to Cena. I don't know if was every fiber of my being. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Lastly, this will be unknown to even veteran league players. But Demacia put a really cool twist onto the Paladin class. You see, in League of Legends, when you play as Garen, his ultimate is to smite his enemies with a giant holy blade. This made people wonder, is Garen a mage? In Demacia? Actually, no. In the lore, Garen has never done anything even similar to this. And that's because there is something even cooler happening. Most people in Demacia pray to the aspect of justice, which they call the Winged Protector. That's why Demacia has a lot of angelic statues. Coincidentally, the aspect of justice can also be found in League, its scale. So what's happening is that when Garen is casting his ultimate, it is not him magically creating a holy blade in the sky. It is actually the aspect of justice answering his call. So even though this universe That's cheating, there's an extra player, it's teaming. Doesn't really have a paladin class, which would be casting holy spells. This would be a really cool alternative. People who worship the aspect of justice and let her answer their goals. <clears throat> Pretty cool, but now let's move on. I'm not doing magic if I'm praying for somebody else to. That's a big brain 200 IQ play. To Noxus. Noxians are one of the only regions who harvest black powder, so they also have their own mercenaries with functional guns. In Noxus you can also find a lot of demonic cultists, so I would expect a warlock or a demon summoner, and they also have a few renowned assassin guilds. 
And the most unique of them all, Noxus also has a circle of Hemomancers, people who follow Vladimir, a lord who used to be a hostage to the Darkin and who eventually learned how to use their blood magic. So these people used the very same blood magic that shaped the Darkin. Then in Shurima we may find arcane mages. These people follow Zerath, the most powerful mage on Runeterra, whose body has been reduced to nothing but arcane energy. I would honestly love to see this class in game, because I love the idea of having an archon form on cooldown. Shurima also has some prophets who can open up tiny portals into the void and summon tiny void creatures. It would be sort of like Warlock in WoW. You know, use the power of the enemy against themselves. Then there are the Sand Shifters, people who can use the sand to create sand mirror images. And we can't forget about the Chronomancers, people who use time magic in a lot of creative interesting ways. Then in Piltover, riding off of the success of Arcane... So it, se <coughs> it seems like a lot of the ones in the last chunk there were all just different types of mages, right? You had your blood mages, your time mages, your arcane mages. Um, yeah, I guess it would depend on the, like if they follow like kind of the World of Warcraft thing with classes and subclasses, or are they going to divide these each into their individual classes, or are they going to go with a more RuneScape-esque, you know, just have everything be free flow? Yeah, I would. I so badly want an MMO to have like that. You know, like uh, I love RuneScape, but like I want a modern MMO to have the ability to just do everything with one character and not have to switch characters and like just you know maybe have like a talent swap or maybe have that you can only put your uh, points in like one thing at once or you know only have like abilities from a certain subclass or subspec or whatever it is at once, but. I would just love for something where you can like actually grind it all out on one character. It'd be so convenient. It'd be so fun to just mix and match. Like have like certain warrior abilities and certain druid abilities and certain mage abilities, and just you know find that fit that you like. And yeah, oh, it'd be so good. Now, people will want to play as a warden, which is a more elite version of the enforcers. These would be equipped with sniper rifles and stun grenades. On the crafty side, there are also the Hextech Engineers. So tinkers. These are the people who can use science to allow them to wield magic even if they are not mages. And separate from them, there are also the Artificers. To them, anything from a powerful arm to blade legs should be possible. And down in Zone, I would love to see some kind of an alchemist, who's using questionable drugs to help his allies. Next we go into the Freljord. Here we can find the Draklorn Inquisitors, which are Lysandra's followers with abilities themed around true ice. Essentially these would be frost battle mages. But perhaps the most iconic for the Freljord would be the shamans. These worship the animalistic primal gods of the Freljord, and all their abilities mimic the primal gods, be it a bear, a fox, a mammoth or a boar. Then on Targon we would find a lot of people with... <laughs> they look so derpy. Notes, you know, calling down stars and such. But there are also the Solari who use the power of the sun to enhance their attacks. They also wear massive plated armor, so this would be the tank class. Or the Lunari who use the power of the moon to stay in the shadows. This would be more of an assassin class. Besides these there are also a lot of star callers around and even draconic worshippers. Then in Ionia, besides the Vuju Blademasters, which would be far too overpowered, some people choose to fight without a blade. These would be the monks of Hirana. They channel the power of Ionian dragons to empower their limbs. And don't worry, they are a bit different from the traditional monks. They are far more badass. Think less Bruce Lee and more Dragon Ball. But of course, Ionia is also home to the Kinku ninjas. Their goal is to maintain balance in Ionia. This means that when a spirit starts killing people, the ninjas go out and deal with the spirit. And when people start terrorizing the spirits, the ninjas go out and deal with the people. Most of these are your classic ninjas empowered with spiritual magic. But some are using the forbidden shadow technique. And while they surely look evil, just like anything in League of Legends, it's not really one-sided. These ninjas are simply using questionable techniques to protect their homeland. 
And honestly, the Shadow Ninjas are so iconic for Ionia, I really do believe they will be playable. Then we get to Bilgewater. Besides all the things that you could do with pirates and monster hunters, the most iconic class of this place are the priests of Buru. The Buru worship the god of motion called Nagake Boros. While they are priests, they fight with full physical strength, while borrowing power from the god to empower themselves. Usually this means the god spawns tentacles to smack the enemies around. But they also have healing powers, so that would be a really cool support class. In Riot's RPG called Ruined King, you can play as Ilawi, the high priestess of Nagake Boros. And there you can She's see the all the attacks bro. she can pull off. And this takes us to the last place, Ishtal, which will most likely be saved for an expansion. As I mentioned in the last video, Ishtal specializes in only one thing, elemental magic. So if elemental mages become a class, and they should, even in League elemental dragons are a core mechanic. They would come from Ishtal. But that's it for all the unique classes this universe has to offer. Funnily enough, when I was drafting all these classes, I realized a lot of them fall under specific categories. Yeah, so you've got um, your warrior, uh, your gunslinger, which I guess you could say is more of a, uh, you know, just your range, hunter, you know, ranger, whatever you want to call it, hybrid, um, mages, summoners, rogues, uh, and then support. Yeah, okay. So yeah, what they could do is just make these, I guess, like, they could make these the different fucking types. Um, again, I don't understand enough about the lore, so maybe this doesn't make sense lore-wise, so bear with me here. Um, but maybe they could just make these six, the, the, the classes, and then have these as different subclasses or sets of moves you could go learn in the world type thing. Kind of like how in, um... You know, World of Warcraft obviously have your subclasses, but in RuneScape, there's like certain magic trees and stuff, that, and like certain magic books that you can get um, to learn like different types of spells and stuff that you can only get if like you go to like certain quests and stuff. So like say you're a mage, maybe you'll just start with your basic mage moves, and then you go to a quest line and you unlock your warlock moves, and like another quest line gets you your fucking arcane, and then so on and so forth. So going with the skin idea for all the classes wouldn't be too unreasonable. But developing so many artistic variations of the classes would be taxing. So overall, I believe Riot should not care about disappointing some players for not including their favorite class. It's gonna be inevitable. With so many options, it's going to happen anyway. Instead, pick a couple of classes that simply make sense for you. You know, a Blade Master here, an Arcane Mage there, and just have fun. Having fun during development usually translates into great experiences. And I hope I'm not pressuring anyone by stirring up hype. If anything, I'm just happy that people find these videos interesting. And all I'm doing is presenting information that Riot released over the past 10 years. I mean, I know the video is interesting because Asmon only paused three times and he said, That's fucking cool. And I like it a lot. And that's what the fuck? This is actually really cool. I didn't know any of this. That, to me, marks a big success. <laughs> Next time, we are going to talk about all the already established raid bosses of this universe. Which is a very personal topic for me. You know, I am a father, my son is two years old. So by the time this MMO comes out, he's going to be just the right age to heal my raids. <laughs> uh. Okay, so yeah, that's... Uh... Honestly, that, that s seems really exciting, right? I, I just wonder how they're going to do it, right? Are they going to take more of the World of Warcraft approach or the RuneScape approach or, you know, a unique approach we haven't seen yet, right? Is it going to be a mix of these different things? Because um, I think that plays a big factor into how many classes or subclasses or whatever you, you know, they end up deciding can fit into the game. A lot of that depends on how exactly they build the game and how they make the mechanics around classes work. Um, but yeah, I would really love for them to make it, and I don't know if this is possible lore-wise, because again, I'm not a huge League of Legends lore, uh, you know, fiend, I don't know a ton about it, but I don't, you know, would it be possible to have 
multiple, you know, basically have one character and then you can learn everything if you're willing to put in like hundreds if not thousands of hours like you see in RuneScape, or is that not possible um, because of the lore of the game? But anyway, let me know what you think down below, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.